push for time, so I didn't get a chance to do the previously on. So let's type in Halloween 2 synopsis to get us up to speed. A year after narrowly escaping death at the hands of Michael Myers, Laurie Strode... What? He wasn't trying to kill her! Unbelievable! <laughs> Fake news, Mikey. Fake news. Go again. October 30th, day before Halloween. Michael continues his pilgrimage back to his holy land, Haddonfield, while Loomis interviews outside of Michael's home, his now desecrated church. Like Laurie, Loomis is also dressed in black. In sensationalizing Michael's life for his own profit, he's feeding on the carcass of not only his patient Michael, but using Michael's axe to enrich himself. He's compromised all his morals for the pursuit of money. The way he treats his PA, bullying, shouting, shoving, when I want an opinion, I'll beat it out of you, is channeling his inner Ronnie. It's almost as if he tried to be the good father to Michael, but that produced such poison in the world that to reconcile and live with Michael's crimes, he's embodied the worst of Ronnie. Laurie draws a bath. A picture of Jesus sits awkwardly on the wall by the toilet. Another son who heard the voice of a parent in his mind. She's haunted by thoughts of reenacting what Michael did that night he killed his sister, slitting Annie's throat. And she vocalizes perhaps what Michael was thinking when he did it to Ronnie. She shares what Michael currently sees, traversing the fields, and their mother presiding over her. To us, this is shot as a psychic connection rather than a nurtured experience as she hasn't been abused by those she loves, that she can remember. But perhaps it's actually a psychological connection to the past via the house that she lived in as a baby. Memories so deeply embedded with no ability to make sense of them. This version of her Boo was buried in a coffin and is now being raised from the dead by her dead mother through the axe of her brother. In taking her last tablet to try and keep these thoughts at bay and begging her psychiatrist for more medication because she feels she can't cope with these attacks. It's always illustrating what can happen when thoughts are suppressed with medication rather than confronted and worked through. She won't share these thoughts, fearing disapproval or worse incarceration. But this means she isn't processing them. She's simply trying to not experience them. Her remedy might come through talking, writing, drawing, in effect, communicating. Her mind is powerful and is trying to process information that she's only subconsciously aware of. And as we know, many of her thoughts are actually rational from a particular perspective. She just lacks their context, which further illustrates the importance of context in understanding. But interspersed with those premonitionary truths, she's also dealing with the fact that she's harboring the same thoughts that overtook Michael when he was young, solving problems through killing. He didn't have treatment, it seems, until it was too late. She's been having treatment for two years, and yet her decline is similar. Her shrink prescribes her Haldol, an antipsychotic medication, and Laurie descends into a tirade, accusing her of phony feelings and simply doing it for the money. Laurie's Halloween experience has given her major trust issues, as expected. But at $100 an hour? Laurie has a point. For a girl working in a bookstore slash coffee shop, this is prohibitively expensive are not particularly effective. In these two films, Zombie is pretty scathing about mental health services generally. Michael continues towards Haddonfield, and Loomis continues to insult Michael to sell his book like a cheap third-rate wrestler. In the first film, Loomis was convinced he was right, and he was correct in his prediction, exhibiting wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge plus experience. In this film, 
His conviction in his belief is the same, but he's 100% wrong. Is it reasonable to think that a man who was shot four times, one of those in the head, and fell from a balcony might have survived? The heroic move would have been to examine the crime scene to gain further knowledge. This would have benefited everyone. He chose to use knowledge he gained in confidence to further himself financially. A selfish gain. Thus, the difference between the wise and the foolish is knowledge, because his experience has actually increased. Laurie has lost all perspective on her relationship with Annie, taking out all her repressed anger against Michael on her. However, Annie was attacked and watched her boyfriend be slaughtered and hung in front of her. She was then tortured by Michael. In the who's had it worse stakes, Annie wins. Laurie perceived she was under attack, but her injuries were sustained in escape. His goal wasn't to injure her. She had a choice. Annie, on the other hand, was attacked. She had no choice. Every blow, slice and stab was intentional. It was to teach her a lesson. Laurie is living like a sort of daughter in Annie's house. Annie occupies that space of head female, a surrogate mother, but with more male energy because of her father's position as sheriff. We never see Annie leave the house and she spends much of the film in her dressing gown, suggesting her world has shrunk to this house, similar to Ronnie who appeared Housebound 2 in the first film. Annie's confrontational style is also reminiscent of the Ronnie that she saw as a baby, possibly triggering the feelings to deal with Annie in the same way that Michael did. While Annie uses sarcasm and passive aggressiveness, where Ronnie used intimidation and active aggression, they're all means to the same end, control. Her criticism of Laurie exemplifies the lack of nurture. Laurie's either drinking to boost the effects of the Haldol or because she's left, having refused the prescription. Either way, she's drinking to try and numb herself from her thoughts. Annie poorly communicates her own insecurities about losing Laurie by taking a stab at her choice of new friends. Annie was never the nurturer though. She was always the male energy in their trio. Laurie's limiting factor in the first film wasn't action. She pulled the trigger. It was understanding. The lack of understanding has blocked her empathy. She craves nurture and caring because that's what will help her understand. But Annie's not a fountain of empathy, hence their problems. Michael's first stop in Haddonfield is the Red Rabbit, the strip bar his mum worked at the first source of his sexual confusion. As the audience, we then find out that the owner, Lou, is the Frankenstein monster that triggered Laurie's meltdown in the shrink's office. This man has a poster advertising Michael's mother linking her to the butcher of Haddonfield. A similar picture to that which Michael was taunted with at school. This was unlikely to end well. Michael brutally kills Howard the Bouncer. There's an element of the big Joe Grizzly kill in this, provoking a fight with a strong male. However, Howard is no Joe Grizzly. Michael wants the altercation, forcing it with his looming presence, making himself an obstacle. Howard has only one option to survive, turn and run. He chooses to front, insulting and belittling, and therefore dies. Michael delivers a number of blows against the mean-spirited contempt the well-off have for the less fortunate. All hail the Halloween hobo! Michael continues inside, believing he's avenging his mother. This is the place that ruined her reputation and was a source of embarrassment for him that he couldn't process. Michael beats and breaks loose bones and bashes the stripper he's with into a mirror. He wants to disfigure her and kill her with the tool that she judged her worth by, the mirror. The savagery of this assault is possibly because he imagines his mother in that same position with Lou, bent over a desk, being used for sex by the boss in his office. Michael in his mind is still the boy. 
This is his chance to right the wrongs and cleanse those feelings of inadequacy. And as he switches a sign to closed, this perhaps signals how Michael gets his closure. Lou is not dead, and we can only imagine he suffers because he continued to dishonor his mother's image nearly two decades after her tragic death. As it turns to Halloween, Michael is instructed by his mother that only a river of blood will reunite them. This is biblical in scale, as if every kill is a sacrifice to the greater good of the family unit, achieving an unholy wholeness and an unhallowed trinity. Halloween arrives. In this film, there are no heroes or even heroic acts. There's just villains and victims. Brackett reads that Loomis has betrayed his secret, exposing Michael's real relationship to Laurie Strode, a truly despicable act. Loomis was trusted. Publishing that betrayed that trust. Michael's knife causes enormous pain, yes, but Loomis causes deep pain with his pen. Loomis forces Laurie to confront the truth of her past without even consulting with her about it first. This shows a shocking lack of empathy. For a girl needing antipsychotic drugs and who's struggling to cope with mental illness, this is cruel. But the book reveals at a subconscious level a truth that she was working out. It's interesting that this vital piece of information that Laurie could have used to gain not only a greater understanding, but an insight and strategy into dealing with Michael, if her mind had been logical, becomes the catalyst for her ever worsening decisions. Zombie is determined not to let Laurie be any kind of hero. In the first film, there were victims and heroic survivors. Not so in this film. And the book, which Michael sees advertised on a billboard, marks the final betrayal for him too. Sparing Loomis has brought no good karma into the world. His kindness hasn't been rewarded. It's made his humiliation and taunting more public. His mother is his conscience. His scales and rules are weighing up the world. Her point about his profiteering off their family's pain is correct. Loomis is trying to use his newfound fame to gain sexual favors from any attractive females he comes into contact with. He's also driving the victim's families to seek vengeance against him. All he's done is cause more pain with his two extra years of granted life. Zombie shows us how emotional thinking blocks rational thinking, and that can have devastating consequences. The revelation forces Laurie into even more self-destructive behavior as she acts out absconding to her work friend's loft, reacting emotionally and avoiding communication with Annie and Sheriff Brackett, who've been her support system for two years. This is her struggling against those hands that wanted to hold her. Her nightmare proves prophetic. Loomis goes on a talk show promoting his book, The Devil Walks Among Us. The irony of that, on this night, while Michael walks the streets with children trick-or-treating and poses them no threat, consistent with Carpenter's version. But Michael poses them no threat because they pose no threat to the 10-year-old Michael. Meanwhile, Laurie wants to get boozed up to dull the pain she feels. But drinking on top of possibly Haldol or whatever antipsychotics are still in her system, worsens confusion, increasing dizziness, drowsiness, and difficulty concentrating, which explains her reactions for the rest of the film. Annie verbally abuses the cop that's been sent over to protect her two years on, and her torrent of belittling and degrading hasn't changed. She is a bully of men, taking advantage of the vicarious authority she thinks she has because her father's the sheriff. Michael's lesson of respect wasn't learned, and this is gonna cost her. Being inhospitable to the cop and not inviting him in increases both their risks of attack. If they were both in the house, then that means Michael would have to break in, meaning a chance to get off at least a wounding shot. Mm. For all the good that would do. 
Her friend Harley goes to have sex in a van. We know that people having sex triggers a murderous rage in Michael. Michael appears out of nowhere to kill him. His years of living and hunting have given him a new level of speed and camouflage. Michael is a stealthy hunter. Before, he was walking slowly because he'd been predominantly inactive. Also, it's unlikely that he wasn't on meds at Smith's Grove, so these were working their way out of his system. But now, he's frighteningly fast. Michael chokes this girl, like he did with Linda, and breaks her neck. This again may be a part of the ritualistic nature of Halloween for him. If so, his ritual evolves each Halloween. Laurie, left alone at the party, full of booze, and with the images she's just seen from the book, helping to give more shape to her memories, can now see what Michael sees. She sees the 10-year-old Michael that she knows with their mother. It's the man Michael that holds her. This is therefore a shared vision or delusion. A shared delusional paranoia disorder occurs when a delusional belief held by one person, the primary, in this case Michael, becomes shared with one other, the secondary. In most cases, a second person is dependent on or has a passive relationship with the primary affected person. Michael spent time talking with baby Boo as he sank into psychosis over those weeks and months. It's possible that is where this started and has laid dormant until Michael's return triggered it. In the two years after, it's been finding its way out of her subconscious. In the vision, man Michael is holding her. He has power over her through fear, but it's the boy Michael that has power over her through love. Her friend Mia finds her and takes her home. Mia is interesting because she's the first friend that Laurie has had that doesn't fit the kill profile. She isn't rude or aggressive or sexual. She's empathetic, sensible and caring. She's sensitive to caffeine. She's what Laurie was two years before and poses no threat to Michael really. But Loomis inadvertently seals her fate because he squandered the mercy that Michael showed him. Michael is in reality at Sheriff Brackett's house. He kills the cops standing watch effortlessly. He mutilates Annie again, this time to the edge of death because she still hasn't learned her lesson. Continuing to emasculate men as Judith did and she stayed in his sister's life after he warned her last time. Michael's mother instructs him to now go have some fun. Similar to what she said to him when she was alive on that fateful night. Have fun trick or treating, okay? But there's a malevolence in her tone this time. His mother gives him permission in her tone to fulfill his desires for retribution. He deals with Annie in a similar fashion to Laurie's mum. Smashing this place Laurie calls home. He has to extirpate her new life and network. Michael repeats what he did to Annie two years before, brutalizing her, but leaving her alive again. This time, long enough for her to die in Laurie's arms when she discovers her. Michael has fulfilled this part of the ritual from his last Halloween. So what is there left to do now?